So biotechnology is using living things and their processes for other purposes and ways to help us. Yeah. All right, so what does that involve? Lots of different examples. We can do genetic testing for disease, thanks to biotechnology. We can do attempts to cure and treat genetic disease thanks to biotechnology, that we call that gene therapy. Um, we've been doing biotechnology for thousands of years as a human species just by doing the technique of selectively breeding our livestock and selectively breeding our crops. Uh, that selective breeding, also called artificial selection, means the exact same thing. Um, we pick and choose which organisms we want to reproduce and just use the results as a, a higher quality of organism. We do technology where we can actually change the DNA of an organism, like change the DNA of a bacterial cell and give it the ability, like magic, to make human proteins. And then we use those proteins for administering medication to people like diabetics. Uh, that's called bacterial cell transformation. We genetically modify our crops, our food uh, sources to be more weather resistant and grow in colder temperatures so that a frost won't come around and wipe out entire fields and cost you know, millions of dollars in, in crops loss. Uh, we used cloning. We can use cloning not, not at, a, at the organism level. We do clone many different organisms, not humans. Cloning humans is unethical, not allowed, not allowed to be attempted in the scientific community. Um, but we're cloning genes, we're cloning organs, we're attempting to grow new organ tissue using stem cell research. Uh, and then there's, of course, the whole concept of the laboratory techniques involved in identifying people by their DNA. And that is a process called DNA profiling or DNA fingerprinting. Uh, and we need a lab technique called gel electrophoresis for that. So that's just some examples. Uh, so the first day I like to introduce the, techni the technology called gel electrophoresis by talking about uh, the death of a really rich guy and a bunch of women come out and say, oh, he's my child's father. I deserve some of his money for my child. How would we find out if we we're telling the truth? Well, we could do a DNA test. Uh, DNA testing has been made wildly popular, uh, figuring out who's the daddy of a certain kid is the topic of many talk shows. Maury Povich likes to get in on that action and he, he has the envelope and he says the results and he's all, all, all uh, dramatic about it. He's like, and you are not the father. And then the whole audience goes crazy. It's really simple DNA testing. You could go and buy a kit yourself and get DNA testing done via mailing your spit sample and they can tell you your ancestry. That's 23andMe.com. That's DNA profiling. So how do those companies that like the 23andMe do it? They're using the techniques and the technology involved um, like gel electrophoresis, as well as more complicated computer analysis of those banding patterns. So what, how does this work? Your DNA is unique to you. Unless you have an identical twin, then you know, you're clones of each other. But everyone else, unique set of DNA. We have a whole lot in common, but there are small, small, small fragments of DNA that's different in between our genes. Uh, and so that's the segment that we've realized we can analyze and compare and figure out and create unique profiles of people. Uh, we identify people from DNA. You've probably seen a show like CSI, uh, or law and order where they use DNA profiling and they're able to catch a criminal because they have a DNA sample from the crime scene and they can match it with their suspects. So we can get DNA from any place that has a nucleus and a cell. So skin that can be left behind uh, at a crime scene, blood, hair, saliva, semen if it's a rape crime, uh, and then they can get DNA samples from the perpetrator and try to match it with suspects. So what they would do is run the DNA samples through this lab technology called a gel electrophoresis apparatus. So you hear the word gel because there's literally a gel like jello. It's like a clear jello pad, think of it that way. Uh, and electrophoresis is electricity. There's going to be an electric current running through this apparatus. So there's a picture of one here um, on my slide. So what do we do to get this to work? This technique is going to just help us separate the fragments of DNA that are unique to each of the individuals we're looking to compare. So if you want to compare me to my son, um, you, we, we would have this process done. And we would each end up comparing and having our own set of banding pattern. That's a picture here on the right. Uh, and in fact, I do have one of these in our classroom. I don't know if you remember, but I like to pull it out when I'm teaching this on that day. It's a piece of artwork that I had made by a company that makes art from your DNA banding pattern after they do a gel electrophoresis on your DNA. Uh, and I had one made for my kids too. Um, so it's cool. It's, uh, it's unique to you. No one else has their same exact banding pattern uh, because DNA is unique to each individual. Now this 
information can be used for artistic needs. Like I just think it's cool and I have a picture of it on my wall. Um, but it's really used in applications like solving crimes, uh, determining family relationships, like paternity testing, uh, or if a child is adopted and then they want to eventually find their biological relatives, they can have DNA testing done. Um, it's also used for our next unit, which is evolution and determining relationships among species. So we know we are, as humans, more closely related to chimpanzees than any other organism um, based on our genetic analysis. We have 99% DNA in common with chimpanzees, very, very small differences. So those are some of the reasons we would do gel electrophoresis. This is some of the technique involved in, in doing the lab procedure. So first thing you gotta understand is these restriction enzymes are required. These are very special enzymes and we know enzymes are proteins and they do a job. These enzymes specific job is to seek out and find an exact location in a DNA list of bases and cut it right there. Um, so there are different kinds of restriction enzymes. You're not going to have to memorize eco R1 and BAMI. You don't have to know the names of them, but know that they work differently in that they bind at a specific nucleotide sequence, uh, and then it's going to cut at that very specific sequence. And what that cut does is it chops up the DNA, literally like molecular scissors you see presented here in this uh, picture. It's a different size fragments. Once we have these different size fragments, we're able to compare them to another person's different size fragments because the number and the size of your fragments are different than the number and the size of my fragments. We have different amounts of uh, repeats, these like little repetitive pieces of nucleotide in between our actual functional genes. Uh, so that's what we're going to compare. How do we compare them? We have to separate them out, sort them out, and make them nice and neat in, uh, in this banding pattern that gets produced by a gel electrophoresis that gets run. So we load these DNA fragments that get chopped up by restriction enzymes. We load them into this apparatus called a gel electrophoresis chamber. Um, and then we turn on electricity and that's gonna force the fragments of DNA to be separated from each other and end up in different spots on the gel, depending on what size the fragment is. Uh, so this was just a practice example of how a restriction enzyme could work. And I did give you something like this to do earlier in uh, the week or last week. Um, and your restriction enzyme is, you'd have to be told where it cuts. So if you are given a very specific sequence of where that restriction enzyme cuts, you have to just then look for it in your DNA sample and make a note, like a mark where that enzyme would cut and be able to tell me how many cuts were made and therefore how many pieces was that fragment cut into. So if an enzyme cuts one time, you realize there are two pieces remaining after that cut has been made. Okay? And then you could count how big each, uh, each one actually is long. So I simulated that here, I made the cut for you, plant species A would get cut once, plant species B does not have that sequence at all in this piece of DNA we're looking at, and so it wouldn't get cut at all, it would just remain one fragment. So the size of the fragments, you just count how many bases there are in each fragment. So this piece right here of species A would be nine bases, this piece would be six bases, whereas species B's whole fragment didn't get cut, so it's still a full 15 bases. This is going to lay out differently in the gel, because what we do here is in the apparatus, okay, so this uh, like light greenish color area is supposed to represent the gel, it's like a clear jello. Uh, there are holes made purposely when they reform the gel, that are for containing the DNA samples. So we'll take a very specialized pipette and inject a DNA sample into one well, and then a DNA sample into another well, and a different DNA sample into yet another well. Um, and they'll end up basically running down the gel next to each other, but end up in different places. So we need the restriction enzymes first, as we said, to cut them. Then we load the DNA into these separate wells. Uh, so mine could go in the first well, yours can go in the second well, et cetera. Uh, and then we turn on the electricity. So if you notice here, there's an electric, uh, there's a negatively charged uh, end on this apparatus, not positively charged end on this apparatus. And so when we turn on the juice, or turn on the power, electricity runs through this mechanism, through this machine. Uh, DNA, based on the, the contents, its molecules, its, its atoms, is just slightly negatively charged. It's just its nature is to be negatively charged. So when we turn on electricity, we purposely have DNA loaded on the negative side. And if you know anything about charges, you should know opposites attract and likes repel. So the negatively charged DNA is going to be repelled from this negative charged electrode and it's going to start moving towards the positive start, uh, side. Now that can only happen 
when the electricity is on. So the electricity is what's physically moving the DNA through the gel. If you don't ever turn the electricity on, then the DNA is not gonna go anywhere, it's just gonna sit in the well. So as it moves, uh, and here we see, we see the negative side on the left, positive side on the right, you could easily see this like vertically instead of side to side, depending on how they arrange it on the picture. Um, so when electricity is on, that's when the DNA starts moving. And what we end up seeing here, these little spots on the gel, these little lines, represent fragments of DNA that got stuck in that spot. So this piece here that's circled is gonna be the piece that moved the furthest through the gel. So that must be the smallest piece of DNA because it was able to move so far through the gel. Okay? These pieces here that are closer to the left didn't make it as far. So they're bigger pieces, they're larger fragments and they didn't make it through the gel as far. They're, they're slower, they're heavier, and they physically can't move through the meshy nature of the molecule of the gel uh, as fast as something small can. Okay, back into this. So the smaller ones move further, the bigger ones don't go as far. So this is just a summary of those same events. Um, and what you end up getting produced is a unique banding pattern. Uh, so the highlight reel is that molecules of DNA move based on their size, small ones move further. Uh, the electric current is what actually turns on and forces the DNA to move because DNA is negatively charged. Now, that's the technique, the lab process. And then there's computers that can analyze the patterns and it becomes more digitized uh, rather than like looking at a physical gel. There's, there's computers that can read the, the banding patterns. Um, now, if we're doing this for a crime purpose, we need to have enough DNA to actually analyze this hundreds of times. We've gotta be able to do these tests over and over again and get the same results. That's just good science. So what we do when we have a tiny little sample of DNA from a crime, which is not that much, we have to make more of it, we copy it. So there's another technology called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, that's just basically like a copy mechanism for DNA. So if you have just one strain of DNA, we can use this copying mechanism, which is basically just using the enzymes that copy DNA in a lab setting, um, and we can force replication. And we can end up with millions of strands of DNA in a very short time period, and we can have plenty of quantity for testing. So that's what PCR is. It's just our ability to make more DNA copying the original pattern and using that enzyme called DNA polymerase. Okay, so this is just some applications. If you were given a, a practice question and you were given these unique banding patterns by three different sets of parents, and then these three babies, you'd have to be able to figure out which baby came from which parents. So you've got to see that, and remember, a baby is made half from one parent, half from the other. So this DNA fragment that ended up here in baby one had to come from one of baby one's parents. So I can see the size of this fragment based on where it falls on the axis here of the gel. The base pair of fragments are listed on the side. And I could see it lines up perfectly and matches with this fragment on Mrs. Stevenson. So I could tell and I could do that for the rest of the baby's fragments and see each of the baby's fragments match up with one of the Stevenson parents. So baby one must be baby Stevenson. So you just have to match and look across and see. It helps if you have a ruler and you're doing it like a paper, not on a screen, um, and you have to see who goes with who. So baby one is going to be baby Stevenson, baby two is baby Jones, because those DNA fragments left up, uh, line up with the Jones family, and baby three has to be baby Smith. Okay? So we can figure out that mystery. I'm gonna skip past that application. Okay, so cloning. Big deal about cloning is students' misconceptions. So you can't clone yourself. Even if you were allowed to clone humans, which we're not, and we don't, and we never have, you can't clone yourself and get another you as you are right now. Because what you would do is you would clone and make an embryo. And that embryo would have to grow and develop and take nine months to be birthed. And then it would have to grow and develop through childhood. And you yourself would still keep growing and developing. So you'll be 15 years apart for the rest of your life. So you can't clone yourself and have your clone do all of your Google Classroom assignments for you. It's not gonna work. Um, and we don't clone humans because it's just considered unethical to experiment in that manner. Uh, what we do clone though is the clone a gene, we can clone tissue, we try to clone organs, um, and we have cloned other mammals. Dolly the sheep was the most famous clone. Uh, so cloning is just the production of a genetically identical offspring, and this happens in nature all the time when identical twinning happens. Those are natural occurring clones, identical twins. Um, 
And anytime asexual division happens, anytime bacteria replicates itself, it's technically a clone of itself. It's just a copy of itself. Now, the technology we use to actually clone within a lab is called somatic cell nuclear transfer, SCNT. So we take, we basically take uh, a, a somatic cell, that's a body cell of any organism we're trying to clone, and we take out its nucleus, and we stick, because that's where the DNA is, of course, and we stick that nucleus with all that DNA into an empty egg cell. So obviously to empty the egg cell, we had to get the egg cell from a donor egg and just throw away its nucleus. Because remember, an egg cell only has half the DNA. But if you're looking to clone an organism, you need the full set of DNA. So you can actually do this with your pet. There's some cloning companies out there that if you have a sample of your pet, uh, like if you ever want to clone your pet and have a clone of your pet after your pet dies, um, it's actually really expensive, but you can do that and clone your, clone your pet. There's companies out there that will do that. Uh, so we've cloned many different animals, organisms, uh, mammals even, but not humans, because it is considered unethical to clone a human. What would you be doing that for? Why are you cloning a person? They're still going to be a person. They're still going to have all biological needs. They're going to have every right a person has. Um, but there are some limitations to cloning. So the first sheep, that uh, the first mammal we ever cloned, like from an adult mammal cell, was Dolly the sheep. Uh, and it took a whole lot of effort, lots of tries, lots of failed attempts, so lots of lost embryos, lots of lost pregnancies, before they actually were successful in 1997 when they cloned the first adult sheep. So uh, this Dolly is the lamb that was just born here, and uh, her mom is Bonnie, and that's who um, donated the DNA to create Dolly. Uh, now, Dolly had some problems. She actually ended up being euthanized, which means uh, they they put her to sleep purposefully because she had a lot of health issues. Now they think that maybe she had the health issues because she came from old DNA in a way. Um, but the technique of how she was made is what we were just talking about, somatic cell nuclear transfer. So this is a good visual for it. So imagine if you're trying to clone a sheep, the sheep you're trying to clone here is sheep uh, a. We're taking sheep A cell from any place in her body, so getting her a nucleus from, uh, a, from a somatic cell, and we're going to put the nucleus from that cell into an empty egg cell here. That empty egg cell we purposely take from a different sheep just to keep our variables isolated. I just don't have any crisscrossing. So this egg cell would be enucleated, the nucleus gets removed, and we're combining the donor nucleus into the empty egg cell, and so you end up with uh, a few cells. So this is a zygote, essentially. Now, this zygote can be stimulated to start dividing into an embryo, this ball of cells. Cleavages can be stimulated with uh, chemicals in the right environment in the laboratory. And then that embryo, once it's at the right stage of development, can be artificially implanted into a uterus, uh, into a surrogate mother. Um, and that would be then yet another sheep just to, again, keep things isolated. And so sheep C would just be kind of like the oven cooking the cake. This is the uterus that's getting used to cook the baby. Uh, none of sheep C's DNA is involved in this process. She's just a foster mother. And then the baby born is sheep D, that's Dolly. Uh, and she was a clone of the one she came from in terms of DNA. So she came from sheep A's DNA. Okay, so Dolly would be a clone of sheep A in this case. Um, advantages of cloning, if you have an organism with desirable qualities, you can mass produce it and have that, you know, those qualities are guaranteed to be present in the organism as you clone them. This might be good if you make livestock and make crops. Uh, this can maybe be helpful in increasing endangered species populations if we clone them, or maybe even bring back extinct animals, but then you might have the whole Jurassic Park idea going on there, um, and we all saw how that ended. Not such a great idea. Uh, possibilities of creating donor organs, if we're talking about cloning at the organ level, this is therapeutic type of cloning, not organismal cloning, and this is more realistic and more of a reason why we research and do biotechnology of cloning. You know, if, you, if your heart fails, wouldn't it be great one day if we could clone your heart instead of having to get a donor and wait for someone to die to use their heart? Disadvantages of cloning. So you got the advantage of everyone in your livestock population or everyone in your crops having the same traits, but that could be a disadvantage as well. Uh, so if there's a lack of genetic diversity, a whole population is actually in, in, at risk if that environment changes. This is going to be more of a focus of our next unit on evolution. Um, so clones don't have a lot of uh, diversity, so that's a survival disadvantage. If one of them is susceptible to a particular virus or disease, then they all are, uh, and that's very risky for the farmer or the rancher. Um, clones do also tend to age more rapidly, as we saw with Dolly, she had more health issues. 
than uh, naturally born sheep. And then there's the ethical controversy. So should we be able to use stem cells for cloning and from an embryo? Should we be able to clone humans? Um, uh, so there's, there's debates on that. So cloning has its advantages, its disadvantages. Um, there's very, a lot of limits on cloning. There's, um, you can't, we aren't cloning mitochondrial DNA and there are diseases associated with mitochondrial DNA that would be coming from the donor egg cell. So the Dolly the sheep clone is actually a combination mitochondrially from the donor egg cell and not from the original one we got the nucleus from. So there's some limitations to the idea of it being a perfect clone. Uh, and then there's these things at the end of chromosomes. There's like a little cap on the chromosome that keeps it from unraveling called a telomere. Uh, and we know that telomeres shorten every time a cell divides. So clones might have uh, more damaged uh, telomeres and therefore their cell division processes are gonna be a little more limited. Technology called selective breeding. This is kind of easy, we go really fast through this. This is just, we choose who you want to breed because we like their traits. Oh, you have a good trait, you have a good trait, I'm gonna make you breed if I'm a farmer, that's what I'm doing. Uh, we do this with dogs, we dog breed. If anyone has a dog, you probably know, is your dog a purebred, only inbred with that particular set of traits? Or maybe your dog is a crossbreed, purposefully trying to blend two sets of traits from different uh, breeds. We do this with plants. So you're just regulating sex. You're choosing who gets to mate and who gets to reproduce. Um, so if it can be done with cows, it can be done with racehorses, you're just picking whoever has the best traits and only letting them reproduce and hoping for those traits to still come out in the offspring. They're not guaranteed to come out in the offspring though, uh, keep that in mind. So we do this with dogs so that there's a variety of characteristics in dogs. Some are more specialized for smelling and hunting, some are more specialized for intelligence, some are more specialized for physical attributes that we think are cute and cuddly. Uh, but there are some negative effects to doing this. So the pug is one example. We bred pugs for their cuteness, but they actually have a lot of breathing difficulties uh, and can't adapt well to warm climates because of their short snout. They don't have enough room in their nasal cavity to breathe well. So they have some health problems because of the way that we bred them. Uh, fruits and vegetables, we breed them to be bigger or sweeter or have a more tolerance for disease or the ones that crack less. We selectively breed them and get the best varieties of our crops in that sense. Corn is, has been selectively bred for a long time. This I had to watch a video on. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the Ed Puzzle on this double muscle cow, the super cow, I think the video referred to it as. So this is not an engineered, you know, purposefully genetically, there's no tinkering involved with the DNA. This is just choosing which bulls are the, the biggest muscle, which um, cows are the biggest muscle, and making them reproduce together. And you ended up with, after many generations of selective breeding, this Belgian blue cattle, which is super cow, has lots and lots of meat, which is ideal if you're trying to sell these cows for meat as a, as a rancher. We've also used selective breeding to breed different species of animals and get hybrid organisms that are then themselves, not their own species because they can't mate themselves. So for example, a mule can have two mules mate and make more mules. If you want to make another mule, you need to cross a horse and a donkey. Uh, so that's how you make another mule. We've got some cool interbred species like a zorse across between a zebra and a horse, the liger across between a lion and a tiger. Um, but again, they're not their own species because they cannot interbreed with each other. So species conservation can be helped by selective breeding. Uh, this is, was the last, I shouldn't say was, because he died, um, the last of these amazing Galapagos Island tortoises with his particular neck trait, this really long neck. And we tried using selective breeding with other species to make more of him, but we weren't able to do so, and he was lost. So there are some drawbacks because in selective breeding, you're not guaranteed the traits in the offspring. It's not guaranteed to happen because sexual reproduction is random mixing of traits. So it might take a few attempts to actually get the desired traits. And it's possible to get undesired traits in the offspring because it's just, you know, based on sex. We're not tinkering with the DNA here. You might even see hidden recessive alleles appear in the offspring that you didn't even know were present in the parents that you chose to meet. And of course, random mutations can always possibly occur. We can't stop random mutations from happening. Uh, some types of selective breeding, specifically inbreeding, when you're using organisms with the, with the same traits or within the same bloodline, uh, can decrease the genetic diversity of a species and could make them more vulnerable to disease. So now we're talking about uh, genetically engineering using technology to tinker with DNA and change DNA. 
Okay, there's a lot of examples of, of how we've done this. These are the most visible examples. And you might have gone to a field trip in your middle school days where you made glow in the dark bacteria. I forget which school goes more, but some students of mine every year will say, oh yeah, we did that. I didn't even know what I was doing. Um, so if you went to a lab and you made glow in the dark bacteria, you did genetic engineering of the GFP protein. So this is a naturally occurring protein in jellyfish that gives them bioluminescence and makes them glow. So when we first started the idea of let's see if we can replace one organism's DNA with another organism's DNA, then they, we said, let's do it with something that would be clearly visible and easy to see that it worked. And so we did that with GFP. So GFP has been used as a marker to identify and show that the genes can actually be transmitted and replaced purposefully from one organism to another. So now that we are know we, we can do that, we do that with genes for other useful traits. So genetic engineering is us purposely trying to change or alter an organism's genetic makeup. We take a gene from one organism and we put it into the DNA of a different organism. Okay, so we have genetically modified tomatoes. We have genetically engineered um, viruses, genetically engineered bacteria, purposefully done in a laboratory setting to change their traits. Right. There's lots of words for genetic engineering. If you see any of these related terms, genome editing, genetic manipulation, recombinant DNA technology, gene therapy, these are all examples of genetic engineering. They're all ways of changing DNA of one organism by giving it the DNA of another organism. That's what genetic engineering school is. Um, how do we do this and how do we apply it? Why do we do it? applications uh, food agriculture we want our crops to be engineered to have higher nutrient count uh, or to have more edible material nobody wants to get a, an ear of corn that has fewer kernels we want an ear of corn that has more kernels it's more valuable it's more nutritious uh, we want crops that can resist disease or even some of them are engineered to make their own pesticide that we don't even have to spray them with pesticide because they make it themselves and therefore they are resistant to insects trying to eat them and damage our crops um, some higher shelf life. This rice is called golden rice, and there's been some impediments to trying to get it going and set, but a, a, the, a large majority of the world depends on rice as a main staple food in their diet. Uh, and a large majority of underdeveloped countries have deficiency of some vitamins. Vitamin A is one of them. So there have been attempts to enhance rice with vitamin A uh, and give it vitamin A and call it golden rice because it actually takes on this golden yellow color. Um, but there are so many people who are against the concept and the idea of genetically engineering food products that there have been blockades to doing this and spreading this around the world. Um, but we do genetically engineer tomatoes, strawberries, make them more resistant to frost, give us a longer growing season. We can engineer corn to resist this type of insect called the corn borer. It's like a little wormy thing that likes to burrow up and eat the corn and ruin the corn crops for corn farmers. It's not a good thing. Uh, so we've engineered the corn to make its own toxin that is toxic to the corn borer insect, but it's not toxic to us. So that's the advantages of, of engineering uh, corn with the BT gene. This BT is the toxin that the corn borers are um, harmed by. So we don't have to spray pesticides on the corn crops that are engineered to make this BT toxin because the corn makes the BT toxin itself. So we don't have to spray pesticides. Um, we're gonna lose less crops, we're gonna make more money, and it's gonna save us money, and it's going to uh, improve crop yield. Now, so what are some disadvantages of using this genetic engineering? Um, so insects can become resistant to certain toxins, and therefore we could have engineered it, and then the developed the insects could eventually you know, not be killed by it, and it might have been worthless at that point. Uh, we also would be killing the insects, which is the goal, but then we have to think further than that. Those insects are another part of the food web, and we have to consider how does that impact other organisms that might be depending on the insects to be eaten. So it might have greater ramifications. Um, and then there's some people who are concerned about long-term effects. Are there going to be long-term health effects? What kind of labeling requirements should we have? What's the, the financial implications of, of enacting those label requirements? Should we use this to end world hunger? Is it unethical to do so? Uh, so there's a lot of both sides on it that we're not going to get into right now. It's a big debate. If you look up GMOs, you're going to find a lot of people against it. Applications of genetic engineering continuing on, we focused on food. Now we're going to talk about it, how we use it for medical purposes. So we can engineer specifically bacteria to make medicine for humans. Crazy, right? So how do we do that? We genetically engineer bacteria 
by giving them the gene to make a specific hormone that certain people with diseases are lacking. And then the bacteria make the hormone in a lab and produce it and we can give that hormone to people who need it. Um, a prime example of this is uh, insulin. Another example is we can engineer bacteria to actually help us clean up the environment, clean up oil spills. That's another reason we would give them a gene that helps them like break down and digest the oil droplets uh, and it can help clean up spills. So how do we do this? Well, what's special about bacterial cells is they have, they have their own nuclear chromosomes, but then they have this DNA in little circular form, which is super easy to cut and paste with. These are called plasmids. So this circular ring-shaped DNA is a plasmid, and we basically are going to, called, it's called splicing. We're gonna cut out, uh, open up the plasmid and splice in or paste in one gene that we've cut out from a human set of DNA. So if we wanna engineer this bacterial cell to make insulin, for example, for someone who's diabetic, we need to just get the human gene for insulin and give it to the bacteria cell. So how do we do that? We do it by what we call gene splicing, which is a mechanism involved in cutting and pasting genes for this whole process of uh, creating recombinant DNA. Recombinant DNA is what you produce when you put one organism's gene into another organism's DNA. Um, and this whole action of doing this in a bacterial cell is called bacterial transformation. So gene splicing is just cutting and pasting genes Okay, cutting and pasting them from one organism into another. That's what genetic engineering involves. When we do it in bacterial cells, we're doing it on the plasmid. So what we're doing is we're getting a gene from the human cell, cutting it out with special enzymes called restriction enzymes that cut DNA at just the right spot. And we're gonna also use a restriction enzyme to cut open this circular piece of DNA called the plasmid. And here in the middle, you can see us recombining them. There's gonna be a little piece of the plasmid that we call it a sticky end. It's just a single strand of nucleotides that is going to perfectly match up with the single strand of nucleotides on human gene we wanna stick in with it. And then it's gonna allow the human gene to be accepted by the bacterial cell DNA, the plasmid. And then what we've produced is a recombinant DNA in the form of a plasmid. Okay, bacterial cells have these plasmids that we, we make recombinant DNA. You can do recombinant DNA in other organisms too, just in this example, it's on a plasmid because it's really easy to manipulate and work with. So then this plasmid has to get stuck back into the bacterial cell. This whole yellow cell over here is a bacterial cell that now has the human gene in its plasmid. That purple gene is the human gene. We gave it the human gene. Now this bacterial cell will use that gene, will express that gene. And of course, if you remember from our last unit, genes make proteins or the codes for making proteins. So that bacterial cell will be able to make that protein that's coded for by that gene. So if this was the gene for making human growth hormone, that's the one that's being referenced here in the diagram, then this bacterial cell will make human growth hormone. And then we can collect it in a lab, put it in a little jar and be able to administer it and give it to people who need human growth hormone. This is just a closer picture of those sticky ends that were mentioned on the cut plasmid and on the cut human gene. So when a restriction enzyme cuts, it doesn't cut straight down. It actually cuts and then goes across and then cuts. So it leaves these um, ends that are only one nucleotide. They're missing their base pair. And that's what allows the gene that you're trying to replace stick on to the, the genome you're adding it to. It's just another example of uh, sticky ends. So there's the, how do we genetically engineer our organisms? We use that recombinant DNA technology, we use bacterial cells to uh, transform their DNA. We need restriction enzymes to splice the gene. Uh, that recombinant DNA is then gonna be inserted into whichever cell, here we're talking about a bacterial cell, that's going to now have the new gene. And then that new gene will be able to be expressed and produce that new protein. So we can take a gene from a fish and put it into the DNA of a tomato. And then that tomato will have the gene for whatever that fish trait was, like maybe resistance to frost, resistance to cold temperatures. Um, and so we do that via recombinant DNA technology, gene splicing. We cut and paste the gene from one organism and give it to the DNA of a different organism. Um, and then in the case for where we're talking about the bacterial cell, the bacteria is then able to make that uh, protein that that gene codes for, and we use it as a medicine. We give people their medicine that way. So we do this with plants, we do this with uh, bacterial cells, and we use them to our advantage, either for medical purposes or agricultural purposes. This is that same picture again. Um, sometimes for health purposes. So now the last thing I wanna talk about is what you did yesterday. Uh, you did a 
web quest on gene therapy. So gene therapy is when we do this whole process of changing the DNA, we genetically engineer the DNA, but this time it's a virus. And why on earth would we change the, the DNA of a virus? Well, if you know how viruses behave back from our immunity unit, a virus needs a host. And a virus's job is to put its DNA into the host cell. So we thought, and we came up with this idea actually many decades ago, but we had a halt until recently. Um, and we thought, well, if a virus's job is to infect a host, let's use that and give the virus a gene we want the host to now get. So let's use this to treat people with genetic disorders. Let's use this to treat, for example, cystic fibrosis, which is a, a mainly in the lungs as well as some digestive organs, there's too much mucus that builds up. So if we are able to fix the faulty gene in someone with that genetic disorder by giving and replacing the faulty gene with the healthy functional gene, then we're treating that genetic disease. We're curing it in those cells. So the idea is we use the virus as a delivery system, which we call a vector. Uh, and a vector is just a delivery mechanism. That's how the gene is going to get delivered into the cells. Um, and we, when we do this, we call it gene therapy. So gene therapy, the goal is to purposely treat and cure genetic disease um, and some cancer forms as well, if they are genetically based. So if you have a faulty gene that leads you to have a certain disease, then we could technically replace it in whatever cells are, are expressing that gene and correct that genetic disorder. Uh, so the replacement would be done by a virus if in the original form of gene therapy. There's different kinds of viruses. They work better. Some work better in some cells, some work better in other cells. That's what WebQuest walked you through. But we use the virus to deliver it. Um, we did trials and we had some success on immune disorders. We had a huge failure on a cystic fibrosis case when, when this was first being attempted. Um, and someone in the experimental group actually died. He did not have a fatal condition, but he died from the treatment, from the virus treatment. Um, so there are some possibilities of the gene getting spliced in the wrong location. The therapy could actually impact non-target cells or an unwanted immune response was the thing that killed uh, that young man, Jesse Gilsinger. Um, but now, and this is safer if we could do this in cells that can be removed from the body. So for example, if we can remove your stem cells that make your blood and your bone marrow from the body, which we can do you know, bone marrow transplant, we can basically take out your bone marrow cells, engineer them, and give them the healthy gene and replace the faulty gene and put them back in your body, then you should make the correct blood cells that were being made incorrectly uh, previously. So we have treated uh, some genetic disease through gene therapy um, in an ex vivo approach, that means outside the body, versus an in vivo approach. The in vivo is a little more risky. And the newest technology we have that does gene therapy for us is this technology called CRISPR. CRISPR is a gene editing mechanism that's actually naturally derived in bacterial cells as a way for them to be able to fight off viruses that try to hurt those bacterial cells. And we realized we can edit and, and create basically a guide piece of RNA to dictate where that CRISPR molecule can go and its ability is to just cut DNA. So we use it as basically a very precise cutting tool to edit genes. Um, really precisely. This is super brand new. This is was discovered in like 2012 that we could apply it to gene editing uh, and it's been used here and there. There was a case in China where uh, a, a researcher used it on humans and that was a big no-no and he broke the rules and the people got are really upset about it. And the person who's probably going to win the Nobel Prize for discovering it, Jennifer Doudna, said, no, no, we got to stop this. We got to shut this down. Uh, and so like, there's a big moratorium on research from the CRISPR right now, but it's, it's incredible with what its possibilities are in gene editing. Now, then the debate comes up, the ethics of it. Should we do it? Well, yeah, we should do it if we're going to treat diseases and help, you know, treat someone's disease, but should we do it for editing other purposes? So the case I was talking about in China, uh, I believe the researcher edited the girls to have a mutation, it was twins, twin girls, he did it too, and he gave them a mutation that gives you resistance, higher resistance to the HIV virus because it changes around a receptor on a cell that the HIV virus likes to try to, to target. So he might have given them some benefit, but they have a mutation that might cause other unwanted effects, and that's permanent, and that's in their genome, and that's in their, their genes forever, and it's gonna be in the genes they pass on if they have kids. So that was a big whoa moment in science recently, and it was like last year, uh, how this is a risky and possibly dangerous situation to put ourselves into. But still amazing, because we can maybe 
and genetic disease if this is that precise and, and easy to work with. Um, so that's CRISPR. That's what I was just talking about. You don't have to know what it stands for. It stands for clusters of regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. It's basically just these little sections of DNA between our genes um, that targets a little specific place of where to cut. Um, if you're interested in CRISPR, you can watch more videos about it. Uh, I'm not going to like get any really more into detail on it than that because we are running out of time. But there's a whole lot of videos on YouTube if you want to learn more about CRISPR and its co-inventor, Jennifer Dabna. She's probably going to get the Nobel Prize either this year or whenever the next one is coming up because um, it's time. They, they really did a, a, an amazing thing. There's a Netflix show called Explained, and there's an episode called Designer DNA. It's very watchable. It's very user-friendly, very easy to understand. So if you really want to get a little more into understanding this, it's called Designer DNA on Netflix. Explained is the show, and the episode is Designer DNA. It's 17 minutes. Um, it's really like, whoa, cool. Uh, definitely recommend watching it if you have some free time. So that was it for the topics. And I do have some questions here, uh, but I see we're running out of time. It is your lunch break, so I don't want to keep you. Practice questions are available on quizzes, which is what your assignment is tomorrow. So you can see some practice questions that way. So on that note, I am going to stop recording. Where am I? Okay, thank you for watching.